it's a singular pleasure to be able to give a talk to future colleagues. So I like that. Um, <clears throat> and so the, uh, this, the, this uh, what I'm going to uh, present to you has an odd provenance which will explain its character. Um, I think, you know, it's a characteristic of all or practically all social ontologies that they pick out one concept and push it, that this concept is to provide the basis of an analysis of some wide range of social phenomena, if not all social phenomena. And so um, I been associated with something called practice theory. And so practice is, is, is the central concept. And ever since I became aware of the notion of practice, there's always been this issue. And is there some other concept that, you know, singularly important concept that one has to use to supplement practices in order to give a more plausible uh, accounts of social phenomena. So when I was a graduate student, and then for some time afterwards, the pair of concepts was discourse and practice. And this was very much a Foucaultian influence. But what you would find that in, people throw around ontological terms sometimes in passing. And so you would see people talking about discourses and practices, and then moving, getting on with what they wanted to talk about, but that would somehow provide the, you know, f ontological framework, their understanding of what sort of thing they were talking about, what concepts were crucial. Um, that, that day has passed. Uh, I have noticed increasingly in the last, maybe let's say 10 years, that the, that the pairing of institutions and practices, and that there are many people who, kind of like the notion of practices, but then are looking for some account of institutions to supplement it. And so it's the same idea that, that one needs to work with both these concepts in order to give um, a, a fuller account. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, or maybe a little bit more than a year and a half ago, I was um, somebody approached me and said, do you want to appear in a... Um, there's some type, I've forgotten the name, but some type of pedagogical type of workshop that they have at the Academy of Management meetings in the States in August. And you want to appear with Roger Freelander. And uh, I didn't know who Roger Freeland was. And, um, and then it was uh, later in the, <laughs> further down in the email, uh, he was associated with the term institutional logics. And I had read the book that was at Thornton, Ocasio, and uh, Lounsbury, Lounsbury, is that it? Um, I had gone through that book kind of because I found it interesting, but I found it quite alien, you might say, from the practice theories that I was familiar with. And um, I wrote this back, and the uh, person who invited me said, oh, no, no, he's actually quite close to you. And I said, really? So I had never read him, so I read an article which apparently has be become very widely read in management organizational studies, an article that he had read. And I'll, uh, Freelander was a, is, a, is an, a sociologist, so an article he had read with, written with Alfort in 1991. And indeed, I was stunned how, how the, he uses the term practices as a basis for conceptualizing institutions. So this became instant, instantly of great interest to me because you have you know, this pairing of institutions and practices and people saying we need an account or a concept of institutions to supplement the account of practices. And here was someone who had given rise to a, uh, a type of thinking that had been given a name in org studies, namely institutional logics. You, know, you go to the program, you see sessions in institutional logics. And the person who was, I guess, most responsible for this way of thinking was, in some sense, a practice theorist. And so, this was, so I agreed to do this, um, this uh, workshop, which meant committing to read things I had never read and had no idea whether I would really find them interesting, but they really were interesting. And um, then, um, so the... Um, it turned out um, 
uh, Freeland couldn't make it to the session in August for health reasons. Uh, he's a retired um, sociology professor from Santa Barbara. And so then one, apparently the business school in Edmonton is particularly associated with this institutional logic approach. So they said, well, we need to get you two guys together. So they staged an event uh, in December where the two of us uh, were supposed to, I don't know what, just like talk to each other or something. And so, um, and so this led to this paper that's about called Forming Alliances because I had read enough at this point to know that I wanted to propose an alliance. And it actually, he turned out, we actually had a ceremonial, uh, you know, signing of the alliance, so to speak. But anyway, so, um, so I'm going to present um, a revised version of what I presented at that workshop. It's been revised in light of the discussions and uh, additional readings I've done since then. Um, I, I've um, handed out an outline. Um, um, I, as, as many of you know, I am a philosopher by training and was a philosopher for many years. Uh, philosophers read papers. I won't go into why that is. Um, and um, it's, um, I've grown to appreciate, it's a, and that's part of the reason why they do it, it's a cognitive burden on the audience quite often to read papers, so I'm in the habit of producing outlines, which hopefully contain all the main points, so you don't have to write anything down. Uh, you can just refer to this and listen, and hopefully that just makes the, the uptake um, uh, work a little easier. So, okay, so let's start with the notion of an alliance. This essay essay essays an alliance between theories of practice and institutional theory, or more specifically, between the theory of practices that I have developed in recent years and the institutional theory that Roger Friedland launched. The premise behind the idea of a theoretical alliance is that a social theory does not cover everything that concerns, bears on, or is connected to its subject matter. Some social theories, of course, aspire to cover the entirety of social life or society. The theoretical edifices of Pierre Bourdieu and Nicolas Luhmann are good examples. These edifices are not suitable material for alliances with other theories since they claim to adequately deal with the subject matters that the other theories address. Most theories, however, are not like this. Most theories address a particular however broad or complex aspect or dimension of society, and as a result, are potential candidates for combining with theories that address other such aspects or dimensions. One can even imagine combinations of more than two such theories, adding up to a very broad, comprehensive account of social life. Okay, I'm gonna skip the next paragraph, which is just about how this is different than the general theory of action, which was a very famous attempt to build up an account that would apply throughout the social sciences. And the punchline from that paragraph is the general, this is the Parsons and Schills, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The general theory is not a theoretical alliance, rather it is a total theory written by an alliance of theorists. Okay. Now other than Bourdieu, theorists of practice have not attempted to develop theories that would cover all of social life. They do harbor what we might call a foundational impulse. That is, most theorists of practice hold sotto voce that practices form a basic reality. Human activity just does take place organized in the practices, which does not mean, however, that one couldn't attempt to offer an explanation of that fact. In the States, for instance, people like reaching for evolutionary theory at this moment to explain things like this. This thesis does not imply that practices are the only basic reality. The brain, for instance, forms another. What the thesis does imply, however, is that practices, or on my account, bundles of practices and material arrangements, that practices form a background or scaffolding for other dimensions of human life. But similarly, the brain forms another such scaffolding. Now, what are these other dimensions? Elsewhere, I've argued that social phenomena consist in aspects and slices of bundles of practices and arrangements. Many aspects of human life, however, cannot be treated as such aspects or slices. 
Examples are experience, mind and cognition, learning, the dissemination of ideas and knowledge, and the constant adjustments that people make as they perform actions. Power, I would argue, is another example. In my opinion, theories of practices are not likely to yield propitious accounts of such matters on their own. To grasp them accordingly, it is necessary to call on other bodies of theory, for instance, phenomenology, the sociology of knowledge, the philosophy of action, Foucault's or Luke's conceptions of power, and so on. Such theories can combine with theories of practices to form richer theoretical schemes that capture broader swaths of human life. So those of you, we, we were just, Matt, um, uh, Matt Watson presented about power, but what he's done is he's, uh, he's taken certain accounts of power like Foucault's and combined them with practice theory. And so I think he's a, a good example of this. The only restriction on which theories of these matters can be combined with theories of practices is that these other theories have to be compatible with the proposition that practices or bundles form a basic reality. That is, their analyses of phenomena must be compatible with these phenomena transpiring on, on the background or in the context of practices. Even regarding social phenomena, which on my account can be analyzed as aspects or slices of practice arrangement bundles, even here, theories of practice cannot be expected to exhaust what there is to say about them. What, for example, theories of practice can say about interactions needs to be supplemented with ideas. You know, are, there, there are theoretical approaches that are well-developed about interaction, symbolic interaction, conversational analysis, you know, study of interaction rituals, etc. The same holds of institutions. Theories of practice yield general conceptions of what institutions are, but more detailed accounts must come from elsewhere. The present essay explores the idea, I should say that the, there's um, a, uh, this is now an article because there's going to be a two volume that, that, uh, issue of the journal Sociology of Organizations is coming out with this article, an article by Friedland, and then a bunch of articles by other people who want to have their say on practices and institutions. So um, the present essay explores the ideas that key features of institutions are advantageously charted in institutional theory, and that together, theories of practices and institutional theories can provide richer accounts of social life than either can on its own. Okay. So I have to start with this issue, what is an institution, because I'm hoping to get some feedback on this issue. I begin by expressing a slight consternation, namely, that people have different kinds of things in mind when they speak of institutions. In ordinary life, institutions are apparently solid and imposing social phenomena that people encounter and have to deal with in their course of their day. In this vein, banks, government departments, and universities are prime examples. Such entities are large, cumbersome, and inertial components of the world that people confront and interact with. Other well-established but less solid or imposing parts of social life likewise, likewise qualify as institutions. For instance, particular restaurants, car dealerships, which seem to often last forever in the States at least, city council members who just never get unelected, and teachers probably all know teachers who were institutions at where they, in their schools. The institution, institutionality of such entity lies in their longevity, together with their reputation, popularity, importance, mm -hmm. and the like. Scholarly work, meanwhile, wields two basic notions of institutions. The first, piggybacking off the ordinary concept, classifies relatively straightforward, sometimes concrete social phenomena that exhibit certain properties as institutions. The properties usually marshaled include longevity, uniformity, standardization, or more complex features such as, quote, interlocking double structures of practices and persons in positions. That's Ram Hare. The banks, governments, and universities that exemplify the ordinary conception of institutions qualify as social scientific institutions as well, since they exhibit some degree of longevity, uniformity, and standardization. 
But other entities, too, can be identified as institutions on this basis, including activities, mental contents, groups, and organizations, as in, for instance, the anthropologist Radcliffe Brown's definition of institutions as standardized modes of behavior. Or Berger and Luckmann's definition of institutions, I'm sorry, Berger and Luckmann's definitions of them as shared associations of actions and roles. The second scholarly notion is more abstract in character. It conceptualizes institutions as more diffuse, long-standing, and far-reaching entities that pervade social life or form context for particular events and actions. Institutions of this sort are as encompassing or pervasive as structures and systems are typically alleged to be. So examples are institutional orders, institutional sectors, institutional fields, and the like. So the whole new institutionalism in sociology that's now carried over into other disciplines talks this way. One widespread version of this idea is that institutions are persisting, pervasive behavioral patterns. A more expansive version is Foucault's claim that everything non-discursive about the social is an institution. Although institutions of the second sort clearly qualify as so-called macro-phenomena, this is not always clear of institutions of the first social scientific sort. For example, a small college. Note that mechanisms. Uh, note, uh, note that mechanisms of insta. Okay, we don't need that. Okay. Finally, in philosophy, institutions take on a new character. Anything that is non-causally made to exist or to be the case through human action and thought is an institution. Money is a standard example. You know, so it's, you go, at this point, I pull a coin out of my hand and say, "What makes this money?" It's that we treat it as money. As we, have, we take certain actions with it, we have certain beliefs and attitudes towards it, and it's the fact that we share these with others, that's, it's by virtue of all that that this little hard object is money. So that's an institution. In enhanced somebody like John Searle, that's supposed to account for everything social, that way of thinking. Um, okay, s similarly, a particular hand gesture is a symbol of victory by virtue of how people react to it and what they think and believe to it. This important conception of institution, which derives ultimately from, from, from Wittgenstein, forms the centerpiece of a general, quote unquote, social constructivist account of at least most social phenomena. Searle, I mentioned, Barry Barnes advocated this viewpoint, David Bloor, uh, Judith Butler has the same position in a more limited domain, but her account applies much more broadly than the phenomena she's interested in. Okay. This idea thus offers a way of thinking about all the other institutions that as conceived ordinarily or by social science. Now, the consternation comes to the fact that I'm not sure what connects or let alone unifies all this. It's a funny word, institution. It tolerates a rather wide range of uses. Both the ordinary and the first science, social scientific conceptions stress longevity and weightiness in the sense of influence, importance, or scope. The philosophical version, meanwhile, analyzes the ontological status of certain phenomena, including, supposedly, institutions of the ordinary and social scientific types. Friedland's conception of things institutional falls under the second social science type. So he is part of this broad new institutionalism uh, that I guess DiMaggio is, I guess, uh, and Powell are the people responsible for this. I don't, this history, I mean, this, I have to say, I did, when I first encountered the new institutionalism, I didn't have a clue what it had to do with institutions. And I still don't quite get it. But anyways, okay. Um, so let's move on uh, to three. So let's start with the substantive content here. And I'm going to skip the first point, which is that both theories are cultural theories because they emphasize the presence of meaning uh, in, in human life. So a more substantial parallel be between my theory of practices and Friedland's conception of institution concerns practices. My account treats institutions as it does any social phenomena. Institutions consist in aspects or slices of bundles of practices and material arrangements. 
Friedland's conception of institutional orders and logic strongly converges with this analysis. Institutional law, this, uh, this is in a very recent article. Institutional logics, he writes, are orders of meaningful practice. Or more expansively, quote, stable constel constellations of practice and the subject and objects coupled to them. So this picture of practices and then subjects and objects are established within practices. I think that's very recognizable uh, in practice theory. Freeland does not explicitly say what he means by practices. He seems, however, to have patterns of activity in mind. This conception of which he confirmed verbally, this conception of practices either converges with or parallels practice the theoretical conceptions of the phenomena as either regular or organized actions. So it seems to me that if you look across the range of views that are practice theoretical, practices are either regularities of some form, including in some versions routines, or they are action they are manifolds of action that are organized. Theories of practice likewise ground subjects, that is, who and what particular people are, and objects, that is, the meanings and possible, possibly the existence of objects, in practices. I think this idea is more or less explicit in Bourdieu, Giddens, Rouse, Chemis, Chauve, Panzer, and Watson, and myself. Now, in their groundbreaking treatment of institutions, Friedland and Alford conceptualize society as a collection of interdependent institutional orders. So we're actually on to C here, so I'm going to introduce a difference. Examples of such orders, institutional orders, are capitalism, the state, democracy, family, religion, and science. These orders, as initially conceived, are domains and thus spatial, even aerial, in character. They are like pieces of the pie called society. Kind of like twisted pieces, of course, not e nice evenly cuts. In sub subsequent writings, Friedland de-emphasizes the spatial character of institutional orders and logics and shifts to thinking them, of them as constitutive dimensions of social life. In the present essay, however, I will continue to treat them as spatial entities. And this is because anything composed of practices necessarily has a spatial form. This is as true of Friedland's initial conceptualization, which treated the spatiality of an institutional order as that of a domain, as it is of his later conceptualization of institutional orders as dimensions, whose spatiality is that of a filigree or a scatter something that we can talk about. Okay, and skipping a bunch more details. Okay, in the 1991 article, Freeland and Alfred claim that an institutional order provides a con context for the conduct of individuals and organizations, and that institutional orders form a society. So in the good old familiar notion, sociological notion. Society consequently forms a broader context for individuals and organizations. So this is, the social is made up of individuals that operate within organizations which operate within institutional orders that together form the ultimate context which is society. I mention this even though Friedland has subsequently dropped the concept of society because it brings up an illuminating contrast with my own account. My, my account treats individuals as participants in practices, though not only this. And it analyzes organizations like institutions as slices and aspects of bundles of practices and material arrangements. The widest social context, moreover, in which individuals and organizations so understood proceed is the entirety of practices, practice arrangement bundles, and that's what I call the practice plenum. A plenum is a sum of particular things, which might or might not relate, that as a sum of particular things amounts not to a bigger things, but simply to a multiplicity. The practice plenum is a plenum in this sense. It is all, that is, the entirety of bundles and arrangements which happen to relate and is related 
form bundles and larger bundles, which we can give a term like constellations to. This plenum stretches out across the surface of the Earth, as well as a little ways under it and somewhat further above it. All social phenomena consist in aspects or slices of this plenum. The practice plenum is not the same as society, as Friedland and others, you know, though the notion, of course, has been widely abandoned, too. One difference is that there's only one practice plenum, whereas presumably there are multiple societies. The plenum is global in extent, whereas societies have less expansive spatial forms. This difference holds even if given societies are spatially fragmented, as when the institutional orders that compose a given society fail to, quote, cohere in space. That's a quote from Freeland, and that's their words. Or if the spatial forms of given societies are indistinct, as when societies overlap. I mean, this was one of the reasons people abandoned the idea. I mean, where does German society begin and Czech society be start? Or, or capitalism. How many, how many, you know, capitalism is the world over, uh, and thus carried out in multiple societies, uh, thus blurring the borders between societies. A second difference between society and the practice plenum lies in the fact that the plenum embraces all practices and bundles, including those that are unique, temporary, or protean, whereas the practices that make up an institutional order are patterns of activity. That is, they are regularities or instantiate generalized configurations and thereby display some degree of longevity. However, there is no reason to think that the wider context in which individuals and organizations proceed embraces regularities alone. Admittedly, the practice of regularizing context facilitates the construction of comprehensive representations of wide expanses of social life, and that's what a lot of, if not most, social scientists are in the business of doing. It does so, however, at the expense of non-regularities, which, above all, historians expertly unearth and that are so important to what happens in social life. Although the practice plenum is not society, it might evince large-scale unities or pervasive configurations. I don't know whether the plenum contains societies. I mean, this is now a disreputable concept. So. It certainly contains societies in the sense of nation states, which exist when states police borders, exert authority over the territories within those borders, and thereby bound other institutions territorially or at least try to. Indeed, bundles of practices are what maintain ju jurisdictional borders in the plenum. An institutional order, meanwhile, requires less organizationally and spatially than a society or a nation state does. So institutional orders, too, might exist in the plenum. In fact, Friedland's conceptualization of institutional orders as practices make them particularly promising large-scale entities to look for there. In this way, it's easy in principle to imagine an alliance between my theory of practices and Friedland's institutional theory. Friedland's theory both is compatible with the idea that practices form a basic reality, and it provides an account of something that is institutional orders about which my account as such has little, if anything, to say. Note that Friedland's theory could not form such an alliance with the practice theories of Bourdieu or Giddens. This is because Bourdieu, through his account of spaces and fields, and Giddens, in his account of structure and space-time extension, claim to offer accounts of institutions. This, this arrangement of possible alliances might reflect the fact that Bourdieu's and Giddens' accounts are sociological in character, while my account is more philosophical. Hence, the guiding idea for, and this is uh, E under three, the guiding idea for the alliance is that the practice pl plenum evinces multiple institutional orders of variable spatial and temporal form that can evolve and hang together with one another in different combinations. I didn't say in my prefatory remarks, and I probably should have, is that uh, another issue, of course, being addressed here is, you know, 
what does practice theory have to say about large social phenomena? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, Friedland's notion of institutional logics. Okay, I want to now give some more detail to this alliance. Each important institutional order, Friedland claims, displays a logic. That is, quote, a set of material practices and symbolic constructions which constitutes the order's organizing principles. Here are his examples. The institutional logic of capitalism is accumulation and the commodification of human activity. That of the state is rationalization and the regulation of human activity by legal and bureaucratic hierarchies. That of democracy is participation and the extension of popular control over human activity. That of family is community and the motivation of human activity by unconditional loyalty to its members and their reproductive needs. Take that. That of religion or science, I love some of these. That of religion or science, for that matter, is truth and the symbolic construction of reality within which all human reality takes place, end quote. Now, exactly what sort of entity are the, quote, accumulation and commodification of activity, or, quote, the participation and extension of popular control over activity, or, quote, truth and the symbolic construction of reality? What are these things? Now, as noted, Freeland claims they, they are at once principles, or sometimes they seem to be more like concepts, and sets of practices that realize these principles. So you got the practices and the principle or the concepts that are realized and then in some sense hold together the practices. But what sort of entity is a principle? And I'm gonna skip over that bit and get to, um, it's a good question what a principle is, but um, he changes the formulation, so that's why I'm skipping over it. In a later article in 2009, Friedland gives greater specificity to the notion of institutional logic. He speaks there of a logic embracing a central axis, which he names, quote, institutional substance. So that's uh, 4B, um, yeah, B now. An institutional substance is, quote, the central object of an institutional field and the principle of its unity. At times, Friedland interprets an institutional substance as a value, that is, as the, quote, most general value that imbues activity in a particular institutional order, or alternatively, as the ultimate reasons why people participating in that order act as they do. So examples of such substance values would be, I guess, in capitalism, property would be one, uh, democracy, love, divinity, sovereignty, and knowledge. These are matters in the German sense of Sachen. They are matters that people and practices place great value on. That's my interpretation of what a value is. Note that the generality and abstractness of matters such as property, democracy, love, divinity, sovereignty, guarantees the existence of many, indeed, in principle, indefinitely many understandings and interpretations of them. So I'll come back to this idea in a moment. Now, in more recent writings, Friedland claims that interpreting substances as values is too subjective. So the very notion of a value is relative to um, subjectivity, so he wants to abandon that. So now, actually in line with his original formulation in 1991, he treats them back again to principles. Institutional substances are the principles that organize and constitute the practices as well as the subjects and objects that comprise an institutional order. They constitute, for example, what individual subjects are by virtue of, among other things, these individuals being emotively invested in and thereby motivated to realize them. So to pursue property, to seek knowledge, to you know, implement sovereignty, and the equipment they use all derives its meaning, you know, so what they are derives from this substance, and so what the objects, the equipment they use in Heidegger's sense, does too. 
A key feature of substances interpreted either as values or as principles is their abstractness, generality, is that their abstractness, generality, and richness enable extensive normative implications to follow from valuing them or from their constitution of subjects, practices, and objects. Indeed, part of it is of what it is for an institutional substance to organize or constitute practices is for participants in those practices to uphold the normative implications. Hence, the normativity, but also the intelligibility of subjects, actions, and objects that imbues the set of practices that composes institutional orders derives from and is anchored in certain greatly valued matters. As Friedland writes, quote, an institutional logic is a bundle of practices organized around a particular substance and its secondary derivatives from which the normativity of these practices is derived. This idea dovetails with the centrality that various theories of practice accord normativity in organizing practices. The French word sens captures the situation perfectly. These greatly valued Organizing matters provide sens, that is, meaning and direction to particular practices, to what people do, to who people are, and to the meaning of the equipment, the arrangements of equipment of materiality um, with which they deal. Exactly where, however, in practices does one find these general matters? That is, exactly how do they lay down the sens that informs um, sets of practices. Okay, we're on the C now. Institutional substances closely correspond to what I call general understandings. General understandings are something, not the only thing, that organizes practices. And what I mean by a general understanding is a general sense of things, an ethos that suffuses and is articulated to some degree or other in the constellation of practices. The idea derives from Charles Taylor's Hegelian idea that pre-theoretical self-understandings underlie practices and institutions. Examples of general understandings, and these are taken from my, uh, are the sense of the sanctification of worldly work that imbued shaker industrial practices, so that's something I wrote about once, the sense of authenticity that is drawn on in contemporary advertising and tourist practices, that's an article by Welsh and Ward in the Nexus of Practices, and the sense of heritage and quality that informs practices of bourbon advertising and distillation, which is an example from uh, a forthcoming book of mine. Understanding such of these imbue practice in the sense that participants act out of them. They proceed out of a certain sense of things, which is expressed in what they do and how they do it. Such understandings can also be articulated in sayings and texts. They can, however, be articulated multiply, differently, and thus conflictuate. And a reference here to Alistair McIntyre's book on tradition, where he claims it's definitive of a tradition that there is conflict over the basic principles, concepts, values, substance, as Friedland's, that, that the tradition perpetuates. And it is always possible for further articulations beyond the ones that exist at any moment to occur. There are always new ways of putting into words such matters as the venerability of bourbon <laughs> or the sanctification of work. In Friedland's words, institutional substances are excessive, and he's consciously using Derrida's term there. Existing art articulations, however, always form the starting point or background for new ones. And it often happens that certain formulations become canonical, or are enforced or pervasive, and they thereby retard new articulations. If I am right that Friedland's substances correspond to my general understandings, then it follows that general understandings of such matters as property, artistic beauty, and democracy organize not individual, but constellations of practices and arrangements. So that's getting at the size that corresponds to an institutional order. Now, as I see things, there's no reason why a given bundle, let alone a given constellation thereof, should be imbued with just one general understanding. Not only can conflicting articulations of any particular understanding be alive in a constellation, but different matters might be central there. 
When either situation arise, conflicting normativities result, thereby making institutional complexity possible. Institutional complexity is a technical term in the institutional logic literature, which means that an individual in an organization, there's a crossing of institutional orders in the organization. So the individual uh, acting is subject to the normativities deriving from two different institutional orders, and those normativities are, are in conflict. They're not, you can't obey both at the same time, so this creates a dilemma for the individual in the organization. And this is viewed somehow as a undesirable complexity of, of life in the literature, it seems to me. These multiplicities and conflicts can always carry over to further constellation. So democracy is an excellent example of this. The conflictually articulated general understandings that imbue the constellations of de democracy concern not just, as Friedland says, participation and extension of popular control, but they also concern representation, compromise between interest groups, and sovereign authority. And one could go on. That is, there's a multiplicity of basic concepts, substances, values that, that together define what democracy is, and they will be interpreted and combined and produce conflicts in democracy. And so political theorists write about this kind of thing. And the mix of these things will vary geographically and contributes to endless complications in democratic life. I should keep track of the time here. What, what time is it? It's quarter past. Quarter past. I don't remember. When did I start? All right, okay, don't want to talk too long. Um, okay, now we're on to D. Friedland writes that, quote, the telos of each institutional field is to produce, accumulate, control, distribute, manage, express, perform, or access the substance involved. Institutional substances are the matters for the sake of which, a Heideggerian concept, people live. Friedland thereby links teleology, that is, ends, to institutional substances. Substances organize constellations by being goods that people pursue, that is, that they desire. So this is part of how an institutional substance organizes the subjects. It forms their desire. What they desire is defined relative to the substance. They, want to, they may want to accumulate it, they may want to eliminate it, they might want to manage it, but it's always, you know, you have this controlling substance. Now, on my account, teleology and general understandings do not need to be yoked conceptually. People can and do pursue ends that neither are defined by nor subserve the realization of matters, general understandings of which inform practices. That is, general understandings join teleoeffective structures in organizing particular practices, bundles, and constellations. In capitalist constellations, however, and I've come, I, I've now learned that this is a very old-fashioned sentence I'm about to say. In capitalist constellations, for example, general understandings of property join with such general ends as maximizing profits in organizing how practices are carried out. To general understandings and ends, furthermore, rules must be added. Rules can derive from understandings and ends, but many rules simply specify pragmatically how to get on in social life. For instance, the, the rule that members of an organization should clear copier paper jams that occur while they operate its machines probably does not subserve some general matter or end that's enjoined in the organization's practices. It's just a way of getting on with things. To my mind, general understandings, rules, and ends conjointly specify the normative sense of carrying on practices. At the same time, general understandings, rules, and ends can be mutually defined. And when they are, teleology and general understandings are yoked. So in other words, I'm saying Freeland's too fixated on, on singularity and unity. And in fact, there, there's a diversity of things that govern in the way he's talking about. Just as multiple general, so we're on to the last, uh, we're getting on to the end of section four here. Just as multiple general understandings can inform individual bundles or constellations thereof, multiple ends and rules can govern activities in them. All the more so in institutional fields, which include many bundles. 
Nevertheless, particular general understandings or general ends can command particular institutional fields. And by that, I mean that they imbue many, if not most, bundles there. An end is commanding also when other ends are pursued for its sake. And this is referring to the hierarchical nature of ends. Property, accumulation, and the maximization of profits probably qualify as commanding ends or matters of general understanding in capitalism. Generally speaking, however, it's an empirical question how many and what combinations of general understandings and ends govern particular bundles and constellations. One should not, as Friedland does, simply assume that single understandings or ends are at work. Okay, now I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff. There's a discussion of real and ideal types vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, institutions. And I just want to get to the, the final reformulation of the guiding idea of the alliance. The guiding idea for the alliance is that the practice plenum evinces multiple institutional orders, which are constellations of practices, the people who participate in them, and the objects they deal with, that are organized by commanding general understandings, teleologies, and possibly rules. <clears throat> and I think it's important to emphasize that not all bundles and constellations in the plenum are part of institutional orders. Only those organized by commanding general understandings or ends are such. So to me, it's entirely an empirical question how broadly the notion of institutional order applies. Okay, I'm going to skip. There are actually two endings to this paper, like one of those movies where you could take a vote on which ending you want. I'm going to skip the levels of society discussion and do the politics conclusion instead. I might read just... Uh, three sentences from the, toward the end of the uh, levels discussion. Just you get some idea of where that leads. Okay, the concrete totality, the practice plenum, does not bear micro and macro levels. Entities traditionally assigned to either level are denizens, aspects, or slices of the one thing, the plenum. Correlatively, theories of practices and institutional theory need not be associated with micro and macro or bottoms-up versus top-down analyses. Theories of practice and theories of institutions can instead be treated as different components of a single analysis of a complex reality, practice theory specifying its basic character, and institutional analysis specifying important, pervasive, or large-scale features yeah. of it. Okay, so... Let's finally get to politics. Okay, I conclude this essay with brief comments about change. Friedland attributes great significance to politics vis-a-vis -vis institutional change. In this context, the term politics designates, see, he never defines it, designates something like the instrumental or forceful self-conscious attempt of individuals and groups in the face of opposition to bring about some state of affairs or to make something they champion binding. Politics so understood depends on power, in particular, and this is going along with Friedland's discussion, in particular on people's powers, which in turn depend on distributions of resources. Politics is also shaped by institutional arrangements. Examples of politics are parliamentary struggles over policy, bureaucratic struggles over jurisdiction and authority, and the agitations of social movements. Not all politics, of course, concern institutions. But Freeland's point is simply that all changes in institutions result from politics. Now, why would this be? Two sorts of institutional change that result from politics are the extension of particular institutional logics to additional domains. So in the workshop we had recently today, example would be what, what uh, was being called marketization. So a certain type of economic logic is extended to more and more domains. So if you think that economic logic defines a certain institutional order, so it's attached to a certain institutional substance. The idea is that institutional substance is now the source of the normativity that is governing more and more domains in social life. So that's one form of institutional change. Another form is um, shifts in which types of people carry out practices governed by particular logics. So that would be like Teach, I mean, I guess example would be asking teachers to think of their students as consumers, something like that. Though those two, cha times of cha two examples are not very independent of each other, are they? 
boundaries among institutional orders, that is where the normative jurisdiction of one institutional substance leaves off and that of another one begins. Boundaries among institutional orders result from politics because they are fundamentally indeterminate. That is, incapable of being abju adjudicated by reason. And here, uh, Friedland brings in Derrida. The same holds of shifts in which institutional logics govern the activity of particular types of person. And an important reason why reason gives way to politics in these contexts is the incommensurability of many key organizing matters. That is the substances. The substances are incommensurate with one another. And I have a Rents reference here to someone that I don't know if people read anymore, uh, Leotard, who, is who unfortunately kind of disappeared very quickly. But it's very similar position as this. Similarly, the founding of any institutional order, though the whole idea of founding an institutional order is a funny notion, is likewise at bottom an act of politics since it cannot be justified by what it founds. Now, democratic theorists have made a lot of this point. And there's the whole idea of the Constitution and what justifies the, the, the formation of the Constitution. It's a, it's, a, it's a singularity in democratic theory. It is because institutional politics are political, that's, I'm sorry, it's because institutional changes are political that, as Friedland seems to point out with regret, that there are no theories about them, about institutional changes. They are indeterminate. They, they, they result from struggles, political struggles, and the results of political struggles are indeterminate before they occur. So there can be no theories. You can. I'm deeply sympathetic to these ideas. Disputes over the jurisdictional boundaries of general understandings and general ends that imbued bundles pit incommensurate sources of normativity and intelligibility against one another and cannot ultimately be decided by reason. Now, of course, the word ultimately is doing a lot of work there, because there can be a lot of discussion and dialogue, and there is. It's just that if people are strongly supportive of values in conflict, reason will never reach a solution. And in fact, political theory for the last 40 years has been, been spending a lot of time pointing out such, such in, incommensurabilities. Likewise, self-conscious attempts to adjudicate ge genuine conflicts about which bundles particular understanding and ends should govern, which general understandings and in ends should govern particular bundles, or which people should participate in such bundles ultimately become political struggles. And as I analyze them more, where political struggles are a general kind of activity chain nexus, and there's a reference to my my new book. Many nexuses of chain of action chains are not overtly political in character, but because action chains are composed of actions, institutional substances, that is general understandings and ends, can in principle be criticized or invoked whenever, at any moment, when chains are extended. And that means at any moment in social life. It means at any moment in central life, you can intervene and criticize on the basis of some of one of these high-level general understandings or ends. And it's incommensurate whether it applies or not. Ultimately, I'm sorry, it's, it, it, to use their story, it's ultimately undecidable whether it applies or not. It becomes a political struggle eventually. Unless, no, the person might just give in and say, you're right, I'll stop doing what I'm doing. Right? But that, too, is a political process, you might say. You know, so theory of argumentation becomes, et cetera, become theories of rationality become important in this context. At any moment, consequently, human activity can become overtly political. Politics does concern much more than institutional transformation alone, but this transformation, as Friedland suggests, clairvoyantly reveals the inherent dependence of social life on politics. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.